Great, so hi everyone. Um, my name's Anna Zakaria. I'm one of the directors of Science Girl. You've got to do the girl. <laughs> Science Girl. Um, if, you want to, if you want to tweet us, we're at science underscore girl. And if you want to tweet about the session, we're hashtag wowbrains in all senses of the words. <laughs> so why are we here today? Um, Science Girl is a network of mostly women. We're inclusive. We, we really welcome men who want to kind of join our cause up and down the UK uh, who work in science, engineering, and also in jobs that use these, uh, use these skills. You know, we've got performers, we've got writers, journalists, um, or people who just love science. So, you know, if any of this appeals to you, come find us at the Marketplace. Uh, we've got a stand there. You can kind of learn more about women in science and also some of the myths that we're going to be talking about this, this morning. Um, but why is there a need for us, and, and why are we here talking about neurotrash? <laughs> and that's because even now, uh, in the UK, women are underrepresented in fields of, of science, tech, engineering, and maths. Mm -hmm. And in some subjects, in some areas, this starts really early. For the last 20 years, the number of A-levels in physics being taken by girls has hovered around the 20% mark. That's ridiculous. But the problem is, it's old news. You know, it's got a lot of attention from government, it's got a lot of attention from business, and it's because it's not just about social justice. There's a really compelling business case for you know, get, allowing everybody to reach their potential. And we're not allowing girls and women to, release, uh, to reach their potential in, in science fields. And Science Girls releasing a report at the end of this month where we ask the question, why? Why is progress not happening fast enough? And we find really compelling evidence that actually it's about cultural attitudes towards women and gender stereotypes that are really the kind of common threads in this problem. And we need to start taking these messages seriously. And worse still, science is being used to uphold these stereotypes. It's being abused. You know, these headline stories about male and female brains that we're always talking about difference. And, you know, why have, it's bad for boys as well. Why have we gendered empathy and emotion? What's that about, you know? And it's also not just an issue for science careers. It's about science being abused to hold women back, to put them in their place. And we've had enough, and we're here <laughs> to take the science back. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. So, laughs> excellent. <laughs> so we've invited Gina Rippon, um, a professor of cognitive neuroimaging at Aston University, to give you a training session in how to spot this rubbish brain science, this, <laughs> this neuro trash. So you're going to come out here armed. And... <laughs> Then Chi and Gina are going to kind of go into it in a bit more detail and talk about how we can fight it together because, you know, this is, a, this is a, us stamping our feet. We've had enough, we're arming you, and then we're inviting you to join our army, our neurotrash army. We want to demand more from society, more from how women um, are viewed in the media, how they're kind of presented, the things that uh, are expected of us, which should be absolutely to reach for the stars. And we want to use science to help us get to a more equal world. So I'm going to hand over to Chi now. She's uh, the MP for Newcastle-upon-Tyne. She trained as an electrical engineer, so she's experienced a lot of this <laughs> gender stereotyping and all these barriers uh, up uh, firsthand. And um, she's captaining our army with Gina, <laughs> co-captains, <laughs> generals. Leading. And I want, to ask, I want to hand over now to Chi to tell us, you know, why is she joining our Neurotrash army? Hi, uh, thanks very much, Anna. And um, hi, hello. Um, so I don't want to start by giving the impression that I take this issue too personally, um, but I will say that this is what I call the Chi on Wara, why are you such a freak question. <laughs> because as a girl growing up, you know, I loved solar systems, planetary adventures, spaceships, and engines, and I, I trained to become an electrical engineer and worked as an electrical engineer for 20 years, building networks around the world, the US, the UK, France, Africa. And I was always told that I was doing something that you know, my brain wasn't wired for, that I wasn't normal, that I wasn't a real woman because I liked to build things and make things and I, you know, I, I, like, that. I like that and um, you know that is very very personal you know, what is more personal than what's going on inside your head and to be told that your biology is your destiny you know, that is a, such a limit on what we can do and what we can achieve. 
And uh, so that's where this training session <laughs> and Gina comes in. Because what we're going to do now, what Gina's going to do, now she is a proper neuroscientist. She's not a pseudoscientist. Proper scientist. <laughs> <laughs> a proper scientist. Yeah, she's not a pseudoscientist, a self trained, um, self-declared expert in how your brains work. She's a proper neuroscientist and she is going to give us all the tools to be able to firstly free our own minds of this like neuro trash, you know, get the neurosexists out of our heads, stop them messing with our minds, and then uh, give us the tools, this, the data, the evidence, the arms to go out as neuro warriors and free our sisters and our brothers. Because this isn't only about the girls, you know. This is about everybody with a brain, you know. And everybody in the human, in human, in the human race has a brain and they deserve to be saved from the neuro trash. So, with that, I'll hand over to Gina for the training session. Thank you, Chi. <laughs> Thank you very much for the intro, Chi. Um, I will get straight on with what I'm going to say. I'm notorious for going on for too long. My students will say I find it very difficult to squeeze what I want to tell them into an hour, so 20, 25 minutes is a real challenge. I would like to say thank you to the WOW Festival for giving Science Girl this opportunity um, to tell you about uh, uh, the neuro trash aspect, which I want to, to describe. Um, and thank you to Science Girl for asking me to uh, be their neuro warrior and to come <laughs> and, and train new people as a, as a neuro warrior. So I'll just quickly, um, Chi's already mentioned my uh, credentials, but I'll just um, confirm that I work in the Aston Brain Center, Aston University in Birmingham. Um, and I get to use all these cool uh, brain imaging tools. So I have an EEG system, which allows me to look at electrical activity and I have an MRI system and also an MEG magnetoencephalography system. Um, so I have lots of really nice tools in order to look at, uh, look at the brain. So my credentials, those are my credentials as a brain imager. I also have some credentials as a mother. Um, I have two daughters, mm -hmm. um, one of whom here is um, suffering the consequences of having a, a mother as a scientist. Um, <laughs> The other one, uh, younger daughter number two, is suffering the consequences of having a mother as a feminist and getting, <laughs> getting dressed up in, a, in a, um, a superhero costume as opposed to a princess costume. She is here in the audience, so you can <laughs> ask her if she's suffered at all from this. Uh, from this. <laughs> okay, right, so what's brain imaging about? What do we really want to do? Why, why are we looking at the brain? This, there's a long history of this. It, it started from um, people taking skulls empty skulls, filling them with ball bearings and either weighing the ball bearings or, or um, counting the ball bearings to get an idea of what this mysterious organ that had been, the size of this mysterious organ within this skull. And, and more recently, you'll all have come across this, this whole idea of the, the kind of uh, neophrenology, the idea that we felt bumps on the skulls and that told us what the brain was like underneath and that would actually give us some kind of idea of where bits, uh, which bits of the brain did what. So this is very early brain imaging. We have, of course, moved on hugely. And the kind of techniques that I use allow me, I mean, apologies for those at the back. I thought we were going to have a slightly bigger screen. I was told to stick to images, but I wasn't told about the size of images. <laughs> so this is an idea of the kind of images that the techniques I showed you we can, we can generate now. So they are beautiful. They're beautiful images. They show pathways in the brain. They show areas of activity in the brain. Uh, we can stain particular cells to show where they are. They are beautiful, but they are seductively beautiful. And as I'll talk a bit about later, therein can lie a problem, because they look very easy. Once, you know, we're a window into the brain. We know how the brain works. As a neuroscientist, I'd like to say, of course, that's right. But we'll see that that's not quite true. OK, so there is some neuro news. I think my abstract said you know, I was going to talk about bad things in, in neuroscience and then mention that we've done some, um, some good things. But I thought I'd start with the good things, particularly if we run out of time. It's nice that you've had the good things first. Yeah. A big breakthrough that the new techniques have um, produced is that our brains are plastic. 
they're malleable, they change, the structures change, the pathways change, as a function of what's going on around us. It used to be thought that, you know, as a baby, you were born with a, the adult number of nerve cells, and what happened throughout life is your brain just got bigger. There was a sort of period of development where the environment might have some kind of impact, but generally it was predetermined. Now we've discovered that there is some kind of plasticity all, all of our lives, even when we're old. There's an idea that, that, that our brain can adapt to changes. A very famous study, which some of you may have come across, um, taxi drivers in London who've done the knowledge. There's a, a part of the brain um, which supports visuospatial activity, looking at maps and finding a way around places. I'll come back to that as a concept later. But there was an early study which showed that taxi drivers who'd done the knowledge, this particular part of their brain, I have got the pointer, but the battery's gone, so it doesn't work. <laughs> um, this particular part of their brain was, was, was larger, so the idea was that the, the, the training that they'd had actually had changed their brain in a particular way. And there's been an updated version of that where they've looked at people um, in a video game, which is like the, the knowledge, and so they've shown that people can actually um, structures and pathways in the brain will change as, 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 a, as a function of the kind of things you do. Juggling is another thing which, um, for some reason, neuroscientists quite like doing weird things. So you can show that if you learn to juggle, it actually changes particular parts of your brain. So really important that brains are plastic, and of course that has major issues for any kind of equality or understanding of, of individual differences. The other thing is um, our brains are permeable all of our lives. Perhaps the term permeable is a bit suspect, but I'm a great one for alliteration. So we've got plastic brains, we've got permeable brains. All the way through our lives, we are absorbing uh, information from the environment. And that's not just very specific training sessions, it's um, attitudes, people's emotional expressions. Our brains will reflect those, the, the particular ex emotions that are being expressed. That can be really important, obviously, to understand the importance of learning and the environment. It can be, and I know this is something that will uh, interest Chi, if there are things in the environment which are slightly alarming, like um, <laughs> the idea that you can have boys and girls toys, that kind of message in the environment, we now know, can actually um, affect the way in which our brains process information. And that's really important to hang on to, because as I'll now go on to say, that, that, that this actually is something which should be informing neuroscience, but quite a lot of the time, it isn't. Okay, so I'm a neuroscientist, really like people to be interested in what I'm doing. Every week there's something in one of the supplements, or there's a book comes out, the brain is X, and I think, oh, it's really, really <laughs> great people are getting the message. The sort of message that's coming across is, is slightly disappointing, so, um, they're, they're hailing us as experts in understanding how Justin Bieber can cause psychosis, um, <laughs> the neuroscience of Bob Dylan's genius, um, bankers and the neuroscience of greed. Neuroscientists can actually explain, you know, the, the banking crisis. <laughs> so you think, OK, um, we've got these wonderful techniques. It's a bit of a shame that that's how they're being used, but, you know, never mind. It, 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 it makes us look important. Um, <laughs> And there are other aspects too, you know, I don't know if you knew that Tory brains are, are different I from, from uh, Labour <laughs> brains. <from there. laughs> so, um, yes, it's a lovely image there, brain buddies, I think it actually says underneath. So, okay, it's sort of, you know, so far so trivial, but it, 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 it's, it's not harmful. But then you do get the kind of messages, um, I hope there's no Daily Mail journalists here, by the way. Yes? Oh, right. I'll, I'll be careful not to be too rude about the telling mail. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm afraid this is taken from the Daily Mail. It was a report just before Christmas. Um, there was a new study came out, new ways of looking at the brain. We're looking at pathways and connections, not just structures. This paper by a, 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 a respectable group of scientists was published in a, a respectable journal. The implication of what they published the male quite correctly reported what these scientists were inferring. <laughs> Men's and women's brains, the truth. As research proves, the sexes' brains are wired differently. <laughs> Clever touch here. Why women are cleverer, ounce for ounce. Um, that actually is referring to the fact their brains are smaller. Um, and men can't <laughs> read female feelings. So we're starting to get a bit worried. You know, right very early on, the ball bearing and the bump um, feelers even then, they were using the data for, for supporting the idea that women, ethnic minorities as well, were in some way inferior. So this is emerging again from this wonderful series of techniques that we have. 
The other thing that, that started to concern me was the influx of these sort of books. Um, classic, Why Men Don't Listen and Women Can't Read Maths. Luan Brizendine's The Female Brain. If ever I feel my blood pressure dropping, I only have to think of Luan Brizendine. <laughs> and, you know, that, if you just want to read one book, which is a classic example of neurotrash, go for Luan Brizendine. So you could say, okay, you know, again, oh, sigh, here we go again. But when you actually start looking at them, it's quite worrying about the misrepresentation of the science. And that's really why I'm here. I'm a scientist, I'm proud of what I do. And I'm seeing quite a lot of the science being hijacked for the wrong reasons. So that's why I'm hoping that all of you today will go away with a few clues as to how to spot the neuro trash, the neuro nonsense. Um, so I've termed, I've termed this um, collection of literature neuro trash because I think there's so much wrong with it, which in itself is, is not a good thing, but it also can be used for, for, for rather worrying purposes. So you get people like Michael Gurian saying that boys and girls learn differently. It used to be raging hormones, and now it's brains. It's proving that there, there's, there is a difference between boys and girls. Simon Baron Cohen, The Essential Difference, such a clever title. Essential meaning natural biology, but also the implication really necessary, that we should notice that girls are empathic and should be nurses and teachers, and boys are, are, are scientists and physicists. The assumption that we're looking at absolute differences, which I'll come back to. So this is what I'm, I'm going to do today. I'm keeping an eye on the time. Um, a bit of neuro-nonsense sen sensitivity training, actually going through some of the science and saying, if you pick up won't say the Daily Mail, um, <laughs> another paper tomorrow, and there's a big article about brains, you can say, ah, oh, I'll just check how good that article is. And it'd be fantastic <laughs> if people go out there and really start um, challenging the assumptions out there. Really important to notice that one of the illusions about these wonderful techniques is that we're mind readers. As though these brain imaging systems that I use allow me to have a real-time picture of what's going on in the brain. It's a bit like the equivalent if, if you've got some kind of ulcer, they can lower a, um, a camera into your stomach and watch the acid digesting something or not digesting something. The implication is that our brain imaging techniques are a bit like that, that it's done in real time. This is a, a copy from a neuromarketing website. Uh, they're real um, villains when it comes to hijacking neuroscience for their own purposes. They're trying to sell a particular advert to a client, um, in this case, Coca-Cola, and they want to show that when the client is watching, you know, when people, buyers are watching, potential buyers are watching the advert, um, their brains will change in a particular way. So I would have shown this as a video, but apparently we're not allowed to show videos because it's YouTube. But what actually <laughs> happens is that the, there's a video um, of brain activity changing um, as you run through, the, run through the, the advert. So you get this picture that... Um, we know instantly, I can sit in my you know, lab and, and watch somebody's brain and, and read their thoughts. All of these wonderful pictures are the end product of all sorts of manipulations. And I don't mean manipulations in the devious sense of the word. There's all sorts of things we have to do to the measures we're taking. Remember, they're just either electrical signals or, or, or changes in blood flow. And in order to arrive at this sort of image, we have to do an awful lot of statistical manipulation. It can take a long time. I can collect a whole load of data in an hour and still be analyzing it 18 months later, or even longer for some of it. So we, there's lots of thresholding goes on, and you can actually, you have to be quite careful that in order, you know, in, if you're seeking for a difference, which again we'll come back to, um, you can, you can tweak the threshold a bit too enthusiastically. You're not quite as conservative as you should be. And there was a group who actually did quite a nice study, um, slightly worrying, and my colleagues, other colleagues, are always showing it to me, saying as though this is really new. They were trying to show that what you do to the images you collect from brain, images, from brain imaging systems, um, you can actually get quite mistaken ideas of what they can do. So these, this group of people put a dead salmon in an fMRI scanner, and they showed this dead salmon pictures of happy and sad faces. <laughs> they collected you know, they collected imaging data, because you can, it's an organic system, you can collect data, ran it through the normal sort of brain imaging statistical techniques, um, <laughs> changed the threshold, and lo and behold, they came up, you can't probably see it, but there's a nice little area of activation there, which shows that dead salmon, actually this part of the dead salmon's brain, is where they tell the difference between happy and sad faces. <laughs> 
So, okay, I mean, obviously it's, it's extreme, but it does give you the clue that we're not, we're not um, mind readers, and very often the people who hijack this sort of work allow that sort of impression to be made. So that's, that's the first illusion, we're not mind readers. The other thing is, um, there's also the impression that we can take these data, a bit like an X-ray, you know, on these television uh, programs, uh, hospital programs, somebody marches in with an X-ray and puts it on the light box and say, oh, 67-year-old female with a broken femur or something. The, I, the, the impression is that that's what we can do with brain imaging data. But unfortunately, as yet, it's not. What we can do is, if we know the task that we've given the person to do, we can match the two together. But somebody couldn't come in and, and, and bring in some brain imaging data and say to me, OK, is that a male brain or a female brain? Is that a male struggling with being empathic or a female struggling with physics or whatever? <laughs> I actually tried this out on a group of colleagues of mine, and I said, I, I produced these... Um, uh, brain images and said, OK, there's areas of activation in particular parts of the brain. Um, do you know what's going on? A um, group of enthusiastic colleagues had a jolly good go. Um, there's a part of the brain called the insula, which is uh, usually uh, activated in emotional situations, and, and another part of the brain called the amygdala. Lots of interesting guessing going on. Just trying to see the age of the audience. Um, <laughs> the, uh, one of my colleagues said, I know what it is, it's somebody thinking about sex. Um, Actually, what, what this is, is somebody trying out different sorts of chocolate. Um, <laughs> so, quite an interesting conjunction there. Um, so, I could, if I was completely unscrupulous in a neuromarketer, say, I've discovered the chocolate spot and go and sell my ideas to, <laughs> to the advertisers. Um, but the point I'm trying to make is that, that, that we can't even, at this stage, read the data back. So again, given the impressions from people like Michael Gurian and, and Anne Moyer, is, is, is this is what's going on, uh, and it's not. The other illusion, um, which is actually not much of a step away from neurophrenology, is that in some way we're, we're brain mappers, that we're producing... I did a scan of an A to Z, it could be a dictionary, that effectively somebody comes along to us and says, I want to be able to tell if somebody's lying. So, you know, I give them my A to Z, and they look up lying, and they put their person in the scanner, and they say, oh, that person is lying. So the idea is that we're mapping different areas of the brain and say, this is the lie area, this is the uh, chocolate area, this is the belief in God area, whatever. I'm glad to say that's not what we're doing, because that's very little, far remo very little removed from phrenology. Um, but again, it's the sort of impression. Very often when you read the articles in, 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 in the less careful journals, it's, this is the area that was associated with tool use, hammers and spanners. There was a, 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 a very alarming study where they were looking at men, looking at pictures of uh, women in bikinis, and, and the, the way in which the data were interpreted was saying the part of the brain that was activated was the part of the brain uh, which is activated when men are using hammers and spanners. And I'll let your imagination um, uh, take, it, take that story to the end. So um, a colleague of mine pointed out that, in fact, you only have to look at our own literature to know that we're not that good at it yet. You know, I don't like to diss what we do, but I, would, I don't want to overclaim what we can do. And for various reasons I won't go into, um, there were some scientists looking for the sarcasm center. In a way, that's almost, you know, don't please don't talk about sarcasm centers. They were interested in how pro people process um, uh, conversations uh, which were and weren't sarcastic for various reasons. <laughs> One group of, of, of scientists produced a, 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 a study in 2006 showing the sarcasm center, or centers in this place, in particular part of the brain. Five years later, same group, same sort of study, same sort of imaging techniques, reported another paper where the sarcasm center, you probably can't see it, but it has actually moved. <laughs> so either, you know, sarcasm has gone through some kind of evolution in those five years, <laughs> or we weren't actually very good at pinpointing it. And we're, and we're not, in a way, that's not really what we're trying to do. But it's a nice little shortcut for people who, who want to cherry pick findings and say, neuroscientists have proved this. So those are the, uh, the sort of um, accidents of, of, of interpretation, which, which neuroscientists may say, well, I never said that. If people want to make what they like of my research, you know, that's up to them. So those are illusions we have to be careful. That's not necessarily down to the neuroscientists. But there is something slightly more worrying. I'm just keeping an eye on the time. Um, 
And that's what I call what the neuroscientists do themselves, the kind of careless research, um, thoughtless research. A um, colleague of mine, Cordelia Fine, who's written a, a wonderful book called Delusions of Gender, she calls it neurosexism. She feels it's actually um, slightly more powerful than that. And I was sitting pondering when I was getting ready to do this talk and thinking, is there a way in which I can categorize these slightly worrying um, issues in, in neuroscience, which are down to the neuroscientists themselves? And this, is what, this group is what I call the size matters matters. Um, and this is the bit where I'll, I'll, I'll go into a bit of sort of techie stuff, but I think what it really is, that there's, there's questions that you need to ask of, the, of any findings and say, have the scientists actually addressed these issues? Okay, so one of these is a thing called effect size. And you'll be pleased to know I'm not going to go into lots of statistics. But if you take a thousand boys and a thousand girls, you give them a particular task, you'll find, say, that the boys' scores are a distribution like that. Um, the average of their scores are about here. The girls' scores are, um, are distributed in much the same way, but for whatever reason, the average score is slightly higher. Now, if you do statistics on that, then you'll find there's a significant difference. And significant is quite a significant word, an important word. That's what gets put in the literature. That's what publishers of ed editors are looking at when they're trying to work out whether to publish your paper. But if you look here, there's quite a big overlap. So any scores that come in this area, you don't know if it's the blue people doing quite well or the red people not doing very well. So not very discriminating. So in terms of what we mean by different, um, you really need to know not just how statistically significant the difference is, but also how, um, uh, what the effect size is. I bet none of you thought you'd spend Saturday morning talk listening to somebody talking about stats. <laughs> I won't go on for too much longer. The key thing is with sex differences, and this is the paper, the paper I talked about earlier, this was actually the biggest difference that they found in any of the measures they reported. Um, there were other ones that they didn't. Tiny, tiny little difference, statistically different, but if you look at the overlap, there's virtually no way of saying that those two groups are different. Just perhaps in the tail here and there, but, but it's statistically significant. But unless your scientist tells you the effect size, which you can if you want to, and why should you, actually? Mm -hmm. uh, you can work out from the data. So it, it worries me, particularly in this area when people are not reporting that these differences are very tiny. And of course, what feeds into the idea out there is that all boys are different from all girls. <laughs> and yet, these are exactly the sort of measures you get with anything. OK, just very quickly, because I'm appreciating the time, um, size matters, bigger the head, the bigger the brain. That's obvious, isn't it? Even the ball bearing brigade worked that out quite quickly when they said, oh, we've got a big skull here, it must be a man's, and then found it was actually a woman who had a big head. <laughs> um, so there's a very easy way. We measure brain volume now. That's a good measure of, of, of how big somebody's brains are. But you need to adjust for how big the person is, how, how tall they were and how heavy they are. You'd think that's obvious, but of course, it's really important if you're trying to compare males and females because, however we like to think about it, there are a lot of men who are taller than a lot of women. So clearly, if you're going to start looking at brain volume differences, you need to know um, how heavy and how tall those people were. And it's quite clear if you trawl through the literature that not everybody does that. And there was a paper that was published recently, which is a big analysis of over 100 studies done in the last 20 years, again trumpeted by an unnamed newspaper, um, <laughs> of proving that there were structural differences between ma male and female brains, none of those studies had actually done a volume correction. So, you know, all you're doing is actually compounding the evidence, which, of course, then feeds back into the environment. Hmm. Now, the very briefly, the idea that the bigger the area of activation, somehow that makes it more important. So quite often it gets reported that if there were areas of activation where there was an overlap between male and female activation, the differences are reported in terms of the size. So the male brains showed larger areas of activation. And similarly with pathways. Again, that's not true. We know, for example, that when people become very adept at a particular skill, um, the area of the brain where that skill is supported 
moves, in fact, possibly from the front parts of the brain to the posterior parts of the brain, and may well change so that the area that's activated is actually quite small. So when you're very good at something, efficient, the area of activation is quite small. So there is a kind of query in the possibly unspoken assumptions behind this kind of size matters thing. The other thing is not too much to do with, with all neuroscience, but it's something which, particularly if we're talking about sex differences, we need to be really careful to understand. I've done this picture of the iceberg, because it's what we call the publication bias. We scientists are constantly under pressure to publish. We've just been through a big research assessment exercise when you either were or you weren't returned, depending on the number of papers and the quality of the papers that you'd published. So there's a big pressure to publish. And the publishers tend to find it more interesting or to feel that it represents the science better if they only report significant findings. So you might do 100 studies on sex differences. 10 of them show a difference, so you rush off and get your papers and your brownie points. <laughs> but 90 of them didn't show any differences at all. So you put them in your drawer. You think, oh, that was a shame, but never mind. But the impression out there, people say, look at the literature. It's full of significant differences. But underneath, there's a lot of non-significant differences that were never reported. And for me, I think if, if this was a drug trial and you said, oh, eight people got better, but um, 90 didn't, but we're going to use the drug anyway, you think, that's really bad science. But actually, that's what a lot of the neuroscience is about. So there's a big publication bias. So that's my kind of squashing everything into a size matters. And again, just briefly, um, this is particularly true of neuroscientists who are just looking at structures. Structures in themselves are quite interesting, but we want to know what they're for. What, why, why are they different in these groups? And there are neuroscientists who will, having measured structures, will then say, ah, oh, that explains why um, uh, men are better at uh, mathematical processing. Or this explains why women are more verbal. But they never actually measured it. So what they're doing is reaching out into the world, taking a stereotype and saying, this explains my finding. And of course, it then feeds back into the world, saying, oh, scientists have found you know, that, that men's brains are different, and that's why, they, you know, they're, um, why they're better scientists, etc." So that's something which, which there are scientists doing. Of course, they feed into books like the P's, you know, why, why men don't listen and, and women can't read maps. For me, the most worrying thing, and I'm just about to finish, is that the neuroscientists themselves seem to ignore what I find are the most exciting aspects of brain science. They, they ignore the fact that our brains are plastic, so they'll take a huge group of people. They'll only describe them in terms of whether they're men or women, because that's, that's easy to measure. They won't find anything about socioeconomic status. We know that affects uh, brain size. Um, they won't find anything about their education, because that, it, we know, will, will, will in, in impact on, on brain structures in a particular way. So they've got this idea that they take this group of people, and what they find is their brain is true then, and has been arrived at because of, kind of some kind of biological factors. And also, they, so they're ignoring the kind of what we know to be the drip, drip, drip of the gendered environment, which is another Cordelia Fine phrase. So our scientists are ignoring what they, they themselves are finding. And I find that really worrying, and it does seem to be very true of literature looking at, at sex differences. And this is a paper, Plasticity, 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 and the Rigid Problem <laughs> of Sex, um, which Cordelia and I uh, and another group have, have published recently, which is addressing particularly this issue. All of those examples that I, I gave of bad science are true of the paper that was published, just be, uh, was published before Christmas and written up in the press. So perhaps not the, the publication bias, because it was you know, not part of the file drawer, but th they committed all of those sort of sins. <laughs> and neuroscientists did actually quickly get on the blogosphere and say, this is wrong, this is wrong, that's wrong. But I don't suppose too many people who just read that headline for a bit of interest spent a lot of time saying, I wonder if they reported sex size, <laughs> etc. Uh, sorry, effect size. <laughs> Interesting <laughs> slip there, effect size. <laughs> okay, so just coming to the end then, um, 
hopefully you've got some tips now so that when we get the next, you know, the next big report about Tory brains or something, um, I mean, there are some differences you might like to prove, but, um, you know, you need to look at the science and say, is this good science? Uh, you, you need to go out there. I mean, science girls are describing me as their, their neurotrash warrior, but it's not something I can do on my own, so I need to appoint a whole load of other neurotrash people. So once you see books like this, you'll know that you can um, stamp something like this on it, or even um, Meta from Mars. <laughs> So that's me, and hopefully you'll all go away and fight the good fight. And I'd just like to say, um, I'm hoping I might be able to patent that and get stickers, and then I can hand them out to everybody, <laughs> and you can go and stick them on books in Waterstones or whatever. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you to WOW, and thank you to Science Girl.